Hello, YouTube. Hello. Today we are going to the Titan Missile Museum just south of Tucson, Arizona. In September of 1981, the Reagan administration decided to deactivate the Titan II ICBMs. Over the next few years, the missiles were removed from the silos and placed into storage for use in launching satellites. In order to ensure the Soviet Union that the silos were being deactivated according to the SALT Treaty, each silo was first stripped of useful equipment, and then the top 25 feet of the silo was blown apart using 2,800 pounds of explosives. After being left exposed for several months so the Soviet Union satellites could verify the completion, they were filled in and made to match the surrounding areas. Only one escaped the destruction so it could become the Titan II Missile Museum. Titan II was a retaliatory or deterrent weapon. It was the largest and most powerful intercontinental ballistic missile ever built by the U.S. The missile's huge 9 megaton warhead could be delivered to targets more than 6,000 miles away in about 35 minutes and was capable of devastating an area of about 900 square miles. The missile's top speed was about 16,000 miles per hour, more than 20 times the speed of sound. There was a total of 54 missiles in service in groups of 18 in Little Rock, Arkansas, Wichita, Kansas, and Tucson, Arizona. Missile Complex 571-7 is one of 18 in the Tucson area, site operated from 1963 to 1982. For the underground guided tour, you must watch your head if you are over 6 feet tall and have to watch out for the desert critters. When you go into the underground portion, you enter a stairwell where you must go down 55 steps and of course you must return up those same steps after completing the tour. The second time, gravity is not necessarily as helpful. Our guide began the tour by explaining all the procedures and safeguards in place to get one shift into the building to relieve the crew on duty. Once downstairs, the last procedure that was explained is how to open the blast doors. You have to work from both sides of the three-ton steel door that creates an airtight seal by pushing a button simultaneously. Once through the blast doors, you're into the protected control center. This entire building is shock insulated, meaning it would take more than an explosion or earthquake to shake the building. All the light fixtures, wiring, etc. were mounted on springs, and if you look closely, you will see the giant springs which hold up the entire floor to prevent shocks. minutes into the, our tour when the unimaginable happened. We received orders to launch the Titan II missile. Charlotte was pressed into service as deputy commander and eventually she turns the key. Two officers, two enlisted personnel. We'll start by talking about our officers, but in order to do that I am going to need two volunteers. <laughs> so our first officer here is going to be our missile combat crew commander. Sitting in this console right in here, let's welcome our commander. And our second officer will be our deputy missile combat crew commander, of course, sitting right over here. Welcome, the deputy. Now, our commander here is nominally in charge of every single thing in the silo. All of the people, all of the equipment, the missile, and the mission. I like a lot of work, but don't worry, because commander gets to do a lot of delegating, and they're going to delegate to none other than their deputy. Now, deputy is themselves a commander in training. One day they'll be in the big chair, but in the meantime, they're our communications officer and our safety officer. Now, as communications, they're responsible for all that radio equipment there behind them. That's four different systems over seven antennas. And, as our safety officer, they're responsible for knowing the whereabouts of every single person in the silo at any given moment. So that way, if there's an emergency, they can bring everyone back to safety. Message. And if they're the same. 
same, well then we have a verified order. We Deputy will give the code to Commander. Commander will read it off to the VMAT. VMAT will insert it into the lock and press the test button. If that light turns green, we have a verified code. We now have everything we need to launch our missile. What's going to happen next is Commander's going to give an abbreviated countdown for themselves and their deputy. They both turn their keys to initiate that launch sequence. Commander and deputy, <laughs> <you just laughs> place your left hand on your key. Right up here. Oh. There it is. Right. <laughs> Commander, you're going to give us a big three, two, one, launch. Both can turn it to the right and hold it for five seconds. Three, two, one, launch. <laughs> All right. Silo soft. The silo door is open. We should also have guidance go. We're communicating with the missile for the very last time. It knows where it is and where it's going. Followed by lift off. Now I said earlier that it's only going to take about 30 to 35 minutes for a missile of this size to reach its target. So in about half an hour, we as a crew will have obliterated an area of approximately 900 square miles. That's an area 30 miles in diameter and larger than Los Angeles and its suburbs. It's actually larger than any city on the planet. And it's all gonna be gone like that. Those are for you guys. Thank you. And those just say, I turned the key. <laughs>
Um, and um, that actually had to go all the way up through the Air Force ranks, through the government, and it actually landed on the negotiations table at SALT. Wow. So there was a year and a half of negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union just surrounding the creation of this museum. Um, and it laid out a whole bunch of different rules that we had to follow, things we could do, things we couldn't do. Um, and the Soviets out of it, they also got permission to start their own museum following the same guidelines. And that museum is located in the Ukraine. I've heard it's a very nice museum, but as of right now, we don't really know what's happening with it. Oh, wow. Obviously. Right, right. <laughs> So, we just left the Titan Museum. That is a fantastic part of living history. They've done a great mm -hmm. job um, restoring what was taken apart or dismantled. Um, just putting it back together, it, it's fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, it's the only one left. Mm -hmm. Only one. There's. It's the only one available, period, right. uh, of a missile museum because you know, they had to go negotiate as part of the SALT Treaty to get this thing, mm -hmm. so. There were, what, there were 54 of them between, divided between three states, Arizona being one, uh, Arkansas, I think Nebraska. They had them all over. Yeah, they had. I think there was 19 in the Tucson area. Yeah. We get a map. But they were, yeah, they were all dispersed between these states, so they destroyed all of them, yeah. and. Destroyed, destroyed, as yeah. in, like, they put dynamite to them to get rid of them and filled them up mm -hmm. so what was incredible about this is that the uh, military folks who were a part of this history came together and said that they wanted to maintain this one silo so that way they could uh, show it to the American people and, and people from around the world who travel here yeah. um, I'm glad they did because yeah. I mean who, who would expect those people they'd be like oh yeah i'm done with it let's get mm -hmm. out of here but right it, it was fantastic fantastic it's very humbling too to, yeah. uh yeah we it's have the only offensive missile um silo anyway that yeah. we have um there's other defensive missile systems out there um a lot of more modern things mm -hmm. too but this yeah. is just great great history and it, it had a bolt or a socket in there um i can't remember what which which silo it was i remember there's a documentary out there you, you can look it up um where we almost had a major catastrophic event because the missile almost launched because a maintenance worker dropped a socket and i think they even killed somebody mm. killed a few people wow maybe. Yeah, yeah, so the measures that were put in place in those years to keep yeah. us safe, because this was only used in retaliation, it was never used as an offensive measure. Right. So I'm just thinking all the safety place, all the safety systems in place in what 1962, but yeah. yet there was no seatbelts, no, right. <laughs> no but airbags. There was, you know, like but they got all kinds yeah. of safety issues there. So incredible. Yeah, incredible. Yep. So. I highly recommend anybody come here. Uh, they do have some parking spots for RVs or larger vehicles. If you're in your RV and just stopping by, I highly recommend everybody come here. Yeah, it's a, it's a good learning experience for everyone. Yep. They have a gift shop. Yep. Uh, they have some um, things to look out 
on the outside so it was a lot of fun yep i want to thank everybody for watching um we really do appreciate uh everybody you know giving us your time spending your time with us uh we will be back next week with another video